So welcome to this podcast from the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. I'm Pasco Fearon, the Annual Research Reviews Editor for JCPP, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Sir Professor Sir Michael Rutter of the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience at King's College London to discuss his uh, contribution, along with Andrew Pickles, to the 2016 Annual Research Review, which is planned to be published as the uh, February 2016 journal. So, Mike, in your article in, entitled The Threats to the Validity of Child Psychiatry and Psychology, could you begin by telling us what you identified as, as some of the key threats to the continuing vigour of, of the science of child psychology and psychiatry? Well, there are several, some of which we can remedy and some of which we can't. So that what we can't remedy is the fact that as uh, comparison with cardiology, uh, oncology particularly, we cannot examine the tissues of the brain during life. And that means that the ways in which the genetic findings on the analysis of tumour tissues has led to huge gains in both prognosis and the development of treatments. Uh, we have no equivalent to that, and we're not likely to be able to have in the future. The second is that this is the era when DSM-5 came out, and um, that was introduced with a lot of banner waving mm -hmm. as to the opportunities, and in our view, the result was pretty disappointing, and we are faced with a lack of a good classification system uh, that works. The notion that DSM-3 introduced, that um, it can be done in, on the basis of discrete diagnoses with very little overlap between them, is just dead in the water. That is not the way it works. And we are faced with the reality of the fact that all the evidence indicates that the overlap between diagnoses is much greater than used to be the case. Now, quite what to do about that, mm. people aren't agreed on, um, but I think they are agreed that we can't just rest on our laurels there. We're going to have to try and develop new ways of dealing with classification. It's a, it raises a very, very fundamental fundamental issue. So, do you have a? This is this is um, pushing you to be uh, uh, um, to look ahead a little bit. But do, do you have a sense of where the most productive avenues for a recasting of, of the of the, the structural measurement of, of, of psychiatric phenomenon should be? You, you, you touched. You made a very interesting point about the potential for bioinformatics to inform yes. the way that we conceptualise uh, psychiatry and, and psychiatric phenomena. And, and there's also sort of a domain that is emerging or has emerged out there already, which is about novel multivariate measurement methodology, such as the, the, the P-factor, for example, as a way of reframing how we measure these, these sorts of phenomena. What's your view about where the most likely positive gains are going to be in that domain? Well, I don't know, really, uh, which means that one needs to think of multiple ways mm. of approaching it um, in the hope that one of them will turn to be Trump's. Uh, exactly which these will be, I don't know. So the idea of a overall factor that goes across diagnosis, the P-factor, I think is a very interesting idea. The paper that first described that, I think it's provocative, but I think it's well-based. I don't know where that'll take us. There are people such as Rudolf Ewer who has said that we need to think and use that concept uh, in our research. And I agree um, that he applies this particularly to looking at outcomes, to look at it solely in terms of narrow diagnostic confines. Actually, unfortunately, if you like, isn't working and won't work. Mm -hmm. um, now, how I put it all together, that I think nobody's got a good answer at the moment, uh, and therefore we need to try and see what is going to work. Multivariate approaches of various kinds uh, certainly have an important place. Um, the 
the SM5 had a fanfare of publicity in terms of need now to have dimensional diagnoses, uh, but in the end they didn't use dimensional diagnoses except in a very limited kind of way. Why not? Well, because nobody could agree on what dimensions. Mm. Um, and, of course, the problem is what you do with the dimensions. So that, um, I think it was... Um, uh, Joe Zubin, mm. the uh, American psychologist, who said that... Uh, all categories can be dimensionalized and all dimensions can be made into categories. And what he was arguing, this is sort of way back in the 1950s, I guess it was, was that it's a question of what's useful. And um, so that if one takes something like cognitive impairment, if you're interested in prognosis, then a dimensional approach works best, uh, that IQ or some equivalent dimensional uh, works. If, on the other hand, you're interested in the biological understanding of what underlies cognitive impairment, it doesn't work. You do better uh, in categories of various kinds. So I think we need to keep an open mind. Uh, I think Andrew and I certainly favoured a, um, if you like, an experimental thinking, uh, I don't mean undertaking experiment necessarily, but instead of just sort of floundering around in an open-ended sort of way, have, have hypotheses, test them, mm. uh, and see what it shows. Mm. Right, yes, I mean, I had a very strong sense from, you, from reading your paper that, that a lot of what you feel will be very, very important is, is a, a, a strong push to a causal mechanistic understanding yes. of, yes. of, of these sorts of uh, processes, and um, on that, can I return back to the to, to the first threat that you mentioned, which was about the lack of yes. um, the lack of, a, of direct access to the to yes. the organ that we yes. that we know is is is, is fundamental to the, to the kinds of things that we're interested in uh, as, as as clinicians. You, you made quite a quite a strong statement, I thought, about the relative failure of neuroimaging yes. to, to really deliver on a causal mechanistic understanding of, of, of uh, psychi- psychiatric phenomena. Could you, could you elaborate a little bit on your concerns there? But also, I suppose, given the spirit of what this paper was all about, I'd love to hear more about what you think um, or how imaging methodology can be most powerfully used uh, to gain traction in some of these causal questions. Well, we, yes, we expressed concerns, but also expressed optimism that Mm. this is certainly one of the technologies that definitely should be employed, uh, as long as it's used in a questioning sort of way. Uh, And we also emphasise there is not a uh, imaging technology, there are several uh, which vary in their strengths and limitations, and that probably the best uh, approach is to take several of them together where that is feasible. Um, and so there's been a concern over uh, false positives um, because of movement artifacts, and children, of course, tend to squirm. <laughs> <laughs> and so that has raised questions. Uh, how far as the findings on um, abnormal interconnectivity among regions? in imaging findings, how far is that an artefact? I I don't know. Um, I think we were unwilling to dismiss it all, Mm. uh, but on the other hand, a challenge had been put down and needs to be responded to. So we would want it as one of the uh, approaches to be used. Mm. Right. And also I had the, uh, the, the impression that you were also suggesting that, that combining these sorts of methodologies, such as uh, MRI, yes. with, with, let's say, neat causal experiments yes. is quite a powerful yes. way to go. Yes. Um, I think that a suck-it-and-see approach we would not favour particularly. <laughs> there are times when we know so little that there really is no alternative but to do that. But the minute you've got something to base it on... 
then you want to try and move to a definite hypothesis and use not necessarily a formal experiment, although they certainly have a place, mm-hmm. uh, but an experimental way of thinking. And so we talked uh, about the use of natural experiments where nature provides a pulling apart of variables that ordinarily go together, and that certainly has a place. And we also talked about um, animal models, uh, which are used very little in child psychiatry and psychology. And we're not arguing that people become animal experimenters, but they need to be aware of what animal experiments can, animal models can and cannot do. Um, They have all the advantages of being able to um, employ invasive approaches that would not be ethically accepted in humans. Uh, They also, however, can deal with model organisms with a much shorter uh, lifespan Mm. and therefore looking at developmental questions becomes much easier uh, than it is in humans. Um, We talk about the need to have animal models that are based either on human findings where there's a question as to what it means or alternatively at least hypotheses based on clinical phenomena. Mm. But child psychiatrists, child psychologists need to be aware of animal models and it is a bit surprising how little use is made. It's true, there's a pretty big gulf between those two. I mean, they don't have a big place in JCPP, for example. No, noted. (laughs) (laughs) So... um, Delighted that we, we may have we may have coined the uh, the, the term the, the rutter suck it and see uh, approach. <laughs> uh, um, uh, sort of leading into that that question, I think uh, was another very important topic in your in your paper, which was which was about the the, the replication crisis, as some people have, have yes. called it. Could you say a little bit about your your what you wrote about the the, the replication issue and and some of the strategies that, that you would think would be important for dealing with that in the future? Yes. Um, Provocative papers have been written on this topic, and they're not wrong. Uh, So that we accept very much that there are many findings that have not been replicated, uh, and we need to take that seriously. Where we take a more positive view is that this largely arises from underpowered uh, studies of rather poor quality. And there is now uh, further papers since we did this uh, review uh, which confirm that. Uh, And so that one of the papers argues that um, be wary when reading research in JCPP or any journal, um, although less often in JCPP I think, of a study based on a very small sample that comes up with a very large finding. That could be something really startling, but it is more likely to be a false positive. And that the replications that do work uh, are based on adequately powered studies of high quality uh, design and high quality measurement. So it's, it's, um, it's not something we should accept as inevitable, uh, we need to take seriously what has been pointed out and say, what can we do about it? Mm. One of the things we talk about is the finding from the Salmon's paper uh, of uh, excessive flexibility in analysis and that this more or less always leads to false positives because you, you keep changing what you're doing until eventually you come across something that's positive. Um, the strobe and consort guidelines talk about the real importance of pre-planned analyses. We recognise and have a brief section in the paper dealing with the fact that you can't always have pre-planned analyses if either uh, the initial findings cast doubt on the initial approach and you need to think of a new way of doing it, or you're dealing with putting together of studies that could not have been thought of together. 
But there we say that the issues that gave rise to the consortium stroke guidelines still apply and that the obligation is to explain why it needs to be done, why it needs to be done in this way and what, as it were, are the confines with which it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So that we're very much a supporter of those guidelines, we express concern with the fact that they're not as... Uh, regularly followed as they should be. I, don't, I think neither Andrew or myself quite understand why, mm. because the guidelines are reasonably straightforward uh, and they make sense. Mm. Um, so why not follow them? I'm going to just quickly jump to something that's slightly on a different topic. But I know that the, 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 the readers of the journal will be very interested in your views on this. There's been this great... Um, uh, sea change in the way that we think about genetics to a certain extent, led to very much by, by the, the, the movement towards microarrays and, and, and genome-wide association studies. You, you make some very interesting points about that in your paper, and I wonder whether you could just talk us through a little bit about how you see that that, that story has evolved, and, and, and uh, in particular your views about gene-environment interaction and how that relates to GWAS studies. It seems quite a, it's gonna, it will be a continually very important topic in the field, I think. Okay, well, let me take them a little bit separately. GWAS clearly is a technique, an approach, a strategy uh, that is valuable to have within one's armamentary mm. uh, because it has the potential of identifying novel genes in a way that candidate gene studies don't. Um, but the problem is the biological understanding that goes with that is not available. Uh, so that um, GWAS, by the nature of what it can and can't do, can't tell you what the genes do. What we know for sure is the genes do not code for psychiatric diagnoses. That's just not the way it works. Uh, they code for proteins and proteins folding. Um, and you're reliant then on um, data sets um, to identify what the genes might do. There's, and there isn't really agreement as yet on quite how these, uh, how successful these are. And we, we reference an attempt that has been made. Um, the f paper um, where from the uh, Mick and Donovan's group, um, I think provide a very nice account of how this can be done really well. And Mick is appropriately cautious uh, about what it shows and what it doesn't show. What he argues is that the findings are interesting in that they, they're not random, uh, and so it's unlikely that this is all nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it provides clues to what might be happening. It doesn't in itself demonstrate that because you can't do that. So that the finding in relation to schizophrenia, which is what the paper was all about, um, showed that not only do this, these um, pick out genes uh, affecting glutamate function, which people are not in the least bit surprised about because other research had shown the same, but had also picked up the possibility that they affect immune mechanisms. Now, that's not what has been generally found, and that's a very useful thing to follow through. Um, hasn't much been done. Uh, so it's telling you the road ahead. Mm -hmm. It's not giving you an answer as such. Now, the gene environment interaction uh, has proved surprisingly controversial uh, at least Andrew and I find it surprising um, and let me just say a few things about that, the first is that we are confident that this is for real because it comes up in uh, experimental studies and in animal models and that gives one some confidence that this overcomes the fact that epidemiological studies can't tell you about causation. I mean, that's just not what they do. 
they can show the phenomenon. And um, there's the famous debate back in the 30s um, between Ronald Fisher and uh, Lancelot Hogman, um, both excellent statisticians and mathematicians, um, but whereas Fisher argued that the purpose of analysis is to get rid of gene environment interactions and get on with the real task of looking at main effects. Um, Hogman, who was a biologist as well as a statistician, um, said, no, uh, we have to be interested in the meaning of these findings. It's the biology. Now, they agree that there are all sorts of artefacts to overcome, so the problems of um, um, scaling, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which we know can increase or decrease the finding, uh, has to be overcome. Um, I don't remember whether they discussed the problems of artefacts that can come from gene environment correlations. I think they didn't actually, but we now know those are important. So it's the fact that the experimental evidence, both human and animal, um, means that it's likely to be the case. Quite apart from the fact that if one thinks about it, the idea that um, sensitivity to the environment is the one and only feature which is outside mm. genetic influence. I mean, that's yes. just implausible. Mm. Now, we're confident that that's a real phenomenon, but we also recognise many of the papers reporting gene environment interaction are so so in their quality. So, the um, solidity of the finding. Uh, of this or that particular gene-environment interaction, one has to be more cautious about. Um, and that um, one of the things that is new on the scene, if you like, is the suggestion, particularly from Tom Boyce and uh, Jay Belsky, uh, that it is, from an evolutionary point of view, unlikely that there are genes for the response to adversity only. It is more likely that there are genes that are concerned with susceptibility to the environment more broadly. Now that's a really exciting suggestion because what it is saying is that when you find a gene, uh, a gene environment interaction, don't leap to assuming that if you find that it means you can do nothing about it because if the notion is right of environmental susceptibility, these are also the individuals likely to be most responsive to therapeutic interventions. The body of evidence on this is growing, um, and it's not definitive as yet, but I think it's growing in which there's more and more suggestions that this probably is valid, maybe with some constraints that we have yet to learn about, but um, it makes one think in a more processed uh, way rather than uh, a determinative way. Mm. Great, thank you. And so the, this notion that, that gene environment interaction provides us with, with a way of thinking about biological interventions and social interventions yes. um, operating on, on closely linked mechanisms, very compelling and conveniently provides a, a, a segue to the, to, the, to the next topic that I wanted to ask you about, which is a very broad one, um, related to some points that you made about the progress that we've made in terms of clinical interventions for children. I think you made quite a strong point that actually yes. quite a lot of progress has been made. Yes. Um, but there are also challenges ahead. And perhaps could you, could you tell us a little bit more about your views on progress and, and, and challenges for, for meaningful clinical impacts for children? Yes, um, so one of the areas we picked out is where there has been progress is in uh, particularly cognitive behavioural therapy, although that's not the only mm -hmm. um, psychological intervention where there's good evidence. And um, I do see that as something which has, is likely to stand the test of time. But we're aware that... Um, when moving from studies of adults to studies of children, 
there are cautions one has to introduce. So the evidence is much stronger for adults than it is for children. Um, and um, we know less about moderating factors. Um, I think the assumption used to be randomized controlled trials gave you the answer to everything and that you, you should not be looking at subgroups. But statisticians, like everyone else, has come to realize that that's an appropriate caution, but actually there are subgroups, there are moderating factors, which mean that this sort of subgroup is either more or less or differently responsive to the intervention. And that needs investigating in the same mm -hmm. sort of way. Yeah, and so that, and the, I wonder whether this is true, that... that, that um there's universal acceptance of that. I, mean, I, I, I think many of us in the field have certainly encountered some resistance from, from trial statisticians about subgroup analysis. And so I, I wonder, it, it seems to me from, the, from, from your general approach that, that these kinds of, um, what you, as an example in a way, of a surprising difference, in this case a, supply, a surprising lack of responsiveness to a cognitive behavioural or a, a pharmacological intervention could be very illuminating in terms of mechanisms. I wonder, what do you think about the challenge that that poses to the scale and quality and analysis of trials? Because I, I wonder whether part of the resistance to going the whole hog with that, you know, down that line of, of thinking is, is what it means about scale and planning and design of, of, of trials. Well, we are explicit that we think that people have got to be willing to fund um, larger trials. Mm. And um, we recognise money is short um, but if you're going to do the job properly uh, then you are going to have to do this and ways must be found for enabling the resources to be available for larger samples because as we have pointed out and as we discussed a little while ago um, a lot of studies suffer from being underpowered and so we've got to take that as a real threat, a real concern, uh, and we need to look to see how that will be remedied. Mm. But would you say the power, so the, but there are power questions about testing yeah. efficacy, and then there are power questions about testing moderation or mechanism. And exactly. Those are quite challenging, aren't they? The power issues are more problematic when looking at moderating variables, mm. um, partly because um, they the data to do this requires information on things that are ordinarily not recorded. Mm -hmm. So that, for example, in looking at randomized controlled trials, um, you rarely find evidence on the extent to which comorbidities have been taken into account. Uh, and yet we know that from the limited evidence that is available, that is important. It makes a difference. Uh, so, yes, if we're going to look at subgroups, we need an even larger sample to be able to do that properly. But we need to take seriously that although there are problems of moving too quickly to subgroup analyses because of all the false positives you can get, mm -hmm. nevertheless, they are for real. Professor Sir Mike Russell, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. And, and thank you for your paper. I know that it will have a very, very widespread impact and, uh, and we look forward to it appearing in, in press uh, in the spring. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.